Welcome to Why I Quit, a show that covers real people quitting their nine to five jobs in search of something different. Listen to inspiring conversations where we dive deep into the stories of why people quit their jobs, what were the hardest parts, where are they now, and any advice for people following the same path. I am so excited to introduce Eric Souter as this week's guest on Why I Quit. Listen as Eric discusses his story of quitting his job to become the first employee at a startup called Fixed. Learn how he discusses the process of getting acquired and transitioning back into working in a corporate environment with the company that acquired them. Get inspired hearing how he quit again to take a step back and figure out what his next steps are. Hey, Eric, thanks so much for joining me today. Hey, Dave, thanks for having me. How you doing? Doing well. Well, I appreciate you coming on the show and excited to hear about your story. Do you mind starting off and tell me a little bit about your initial college education and what that led to for your first job? Yeah, sure. I started, uh, I went to University of Delaware, uh, graduated in 2011, had a degree in electrical engineering, computer science and math minors. So kind of started my early career looking in like the programming, electrical engineering, computer engineering type area, ended up working with a, a government contractor, doing some stuff there for, you know, about a year and a half. And then from there kind of kicked off my, let's say more like web application development career, working for a small cybersecurity company. Kind of going from college into that first job, you know, what was kind of your expectation in terms of, did you think you were going to be, you know, kind of in a corporate role for the you know, an extended period of time? Did you ever have any like kind of like entrepreneurial aspirations or what did that look like for you? I think that coming out of college, part of it was just like securing a job, right? Like it was just kind of like, that was what you do. As I was there, I definitely, uh, I think the, the entrepreneurial itch started coming out a little, started an LLC with my friend. It never actually went anywhere, but we, we applied to an accelerator, kind of started using that as an opportunity to continue to learn software development and, and built a little prototype of an app. And that kind of is what led me to the next steps. And tell me about as you're, you know, working on some side projects and thinking about that aspect, you know, were you at a point when you were thinking about what an exit strategy from that full-time role looked like? You know, did you want to have like a certain amount of money in the bank, revenue raised or validation to get to that point? Or, you know, where was your head at at that time? Yeah, I think at that time it was just about finding that first job, breaking into kind of, you know, the software development, you know, developing web apps, things like that. It's sometimes getting that first job is like a junior engineer is the hardest. And at my current job, I would say, I didn't feel like I was progressing a lot. I had had like a manager leave and that transition process as far as like, who was my new manager hadn't gone very smoothly. And so I had started looking and, you know, just had some interviews, some places, some, some of jobs I wasn't qualified for, but luckily found a really good fit, uh, with a good group of people. And I think it really helped me, let me develop from there. From that transition, when you switched, uh, into that new role, was that also a full-time role there with like a corporate job or was that a startup or what did that look like? Yeah, it was a, uh, it's a startup called Looking Glass. They're a cybersecurity focused startup. And so I was mostly doing front end type stuff for them, some full stack things, but I was, you know, still pretty young. So kind of learning the ropes. I guess, tell me about a little bit of your, kind of your expectations versus reality of those initial full-time jobs. Were you trying to, you know, just kind of learn as much as you can and still tinkering with stuff on the side and hoping that something worked? Did, at that time, were you looking just to progress your career or, you know, what did, what did that look like for you? Yeah, I think, I think at that point, just getting that new job was like enough to have a, to solely focus on that. You know, I'd done programming and coding and stuff like that, but as far as like actual application development on a team, it was just like a new world to me. Like, I didn't know what GitHub was. I didn't know what, you know, all the kinds of tools, uh, Trello, like things like that, that we were using back then. So learning those processes, but also just like continuing to grow as a, as a developer. That was a kind of major focus for me at that time. Uh, and I think I made some like big leaps, just like being immersed in those things for 40, 50 hours a week. Right. That's, that's typically, I think that like eight to 10 months is when like those junior developers, junior engineers, they really grow because they're, they're not just doing side projects. They have guidance, they have mentors, you know, things like that. So, um, yeah, I'd say that was my focus really at that time. At that time, are you still 
testing out things on the side? Are you still exploring anything in the entre entrepreneurship space or was that on pause at that moment? I think I always still had the ambitions, but again, I was just pretty occupied with that for a bit. Um, it was also just like a really good place to work, you know, shout out to that crew if anyone ever watches this, but uh, it was just like a bunch of good, smart people. A lot of them went on to do some really cool things at, at other big companies. And so, no, I wasn't really looking at the time. Uh, I, I did get like a LinkedIn message one day from my eventual CEO and, and good friend at my next company. But I wasn't, I wasn't really looking yet. It actually, what really took me to finally start considering making the leap was just like a couple bad days at work and not just like a couple, but like, you know, things change, right? Like, and so, you know, there's a frustrating day and it's like, Hey, like I should be still looking out for myself. Like I, and I'll have this conversation uh, and that kind of spawned those next opportunities. From that initial LinkedIn message to when you finally made the jump. You know, what was the time period in between that until you officially made the leap over? And then what, what was that process like? You know, was it a hard process leaving and what did that look like for you? It was probably about a couple of months. Me and, and Luke, who was the CEO of my eventual company, Fixed, we probably talked a few times over lunch. And, you know, that can be hard to schedule and things like that. You know, again, for me, I wasn't like fully looking to leave. But as those conversations developed, as I got to meet the other co-founder, it just kind of felt right. And then, you know, it's just about figuring out the details and whether or not it would work out. And then I kind of just made the leap. I think it, looking back, there probably wasn't, there was a lot of thought about it. Like there was a reason I was jumping to an even smaller company, right? So I went from like a 3000 plus person company to like a 30 person company. And now I was about to be the third person at a company, right? So there's kind of a pattern developing there. That was intentional. Like I did, I wanted to continue to learn and like develop those skills and like eventually be able to start my own company, et cetera, et cetera. So there was some, uh, some intentional steps there, but also like things just happen fast. And, you know, I was impressed with the, the two founders and, and also just made the leap eventually after a few months. And talk to me a little bit about your comfortability level with jumping as well as like risk tolerance, you know, going to be point number three at a, <laughs> at a startup, you know, I'm assuming, you know, you're sacrificing, uh, in terms of the financial side and, you know, obviously, you know, probably working more and things like that. Where was your head at in terms of your, you know, confidence and, you know, kind of expectations heading into that role? It was definitely a big leap and it was a risky one. I think maybe I didn't appreciate that at the time just because I guess my first, I mean, it wasn't my first startup, but like the other company was more developed and you just kind of have this impression that, you know, the start's going to be successful quickly and, and everything's going to pay off and, and those kinds of things. So I, I always anticipated, Hey, if I take a big salary cut, which obviously is generally necessary, if you're really going to be the first hire, I'll catch up quickly. Right. And, but that was always my mindset that like the, any, any of those cuts I took, you know, whether it was salary or working more, et cetera, it was always about the skills that I knew I was going to develop that would in the long run make me, more skilled, a better employee, like, you know, all those things that would, it would pay off. So it was kind of always a longer term investment, I'd say, even if in the shorter term, it was, you know, sacrifice, making some sacrifices. And there were sacrifices, like, you, you, you know, I, I caught up over time and, you know, it was fortunate that, you know, we, we were able to be successful and, you know, some raises and things like that, but you still make sacrifices, right? You know, even like in your personal life, right? Because, you know, some of your friends might be working corporate jobs and, they're getting these big bonuses and raises and it's just not, it's just not startup life. Right. So yeah, there was definitely some of those, but you know, longer term outcomes was always my focus. And, and I think it, I think it worked out. And talk to me a little bit about uh, expectations versus reality in terms of joining a startup. I know a lot of times it's looked at as a glamorous thing, but um, it can be different, you know, behind the hood in terms of like, you know, kind of growing that. And I think, you know, especially going from a bigger team to a smaller team, I'm sure you were wearing a lot more hats too. So what did, what did that look like for you? Yeah. I mean, I think you touched on a good point. The, the, the idea of a startup is, is so like kind of stereotyped and there's like this, always this like, maybe, I don't know, positive image. People want to grind. They want to be a part of a startup. Right. And we'd even interview people and they're like, you know, why do you want to work here? And they're like, I want to be a part of a startup, but there wasn't, always like depth to that. It was just like, they thought it was the cool thing to do. And I think it's, I think the reality is it's, it's a lot of peaks and a lot of valleys, right? So it's an amazing opportunity to learn. You're being thrown into situations that 
that you otherwise shouldn't be, maybe it's thrown into rooms that you probably shouldn't be in, just whether it's with like clients or things like that, because ultimately there's no one above you that, you know, like there normally would be at a company. So, but, but ultimately that makes you a lot better in the long term. There's those things. I think those are the positives, right? You, but that's also tough and it can be stressful and even having to worry about like money and those kinds of things. And so I don't know that I ever really doubted it or regretted it, but there was definitely like harder times, right? It's, it's a lot of work. And as we go further in the conversation, you'll hear some of those like things reflected in like what I'm thinking about now and like my mindset, but you know, it's a very rewarding experience, but it's also not for everyone. And uh, especially if you don't know what the true experience is like. Talk to me a little bit about as you got to the point from uh, Fix getting acquired. And so what was, you know, one, what what did that milestone mean to you? And kind of like, what did that look like after all those like years of hard work? And then kind of what was the experience of, you know, kind of going back into a corporate setting? And so like, what did that look like on the, on the other hand as well? Yeah. So in August of 2020, uh, Fix was acquired by a large Fortune 500 insurance company, Assurant. And it was, I mean, it was a great milestone. Like it was, it's, you know, part of why you join a startup, right? And, you know, in some ways it was an indicator that we had been successful. You know, it's not always the case with acquisitions, but it was, it was something to kind of tip your hat to, right? And made a lot of the process feel worth it. You know, it was hard. Acquisitions are like really stressful if you're ever involved with one, just like, you know, it's kind of like you're in a room and there's like a lawyer who, you know, wants to buy your company. You're telling them why they should, and they're trying to figure out like why they shouldn't, or maybe why it should be cheaper, right? That's kind of just the nature of like an acquisition. And it was very stressful. That made it even better getting through it. Uh, this was also right during the pandemic. So it was kind of like unheard of to just like f almost fully be acquired remotely. Like we never, I guess it's kind of a good shout out for, for, for a podcast like this, right? Like talking about people working remotely and traveling and things like that. So that was cool. But yeah, I mean, then obviously there's, there's moving into like the corporate world and it was definitely different. I mean, we were fortunate that we're kind of still maintaining our product, right? You don't just jump in and everything changes. Uh, you're still in charge of your product. And over time that's involves integrating and into the other company systems and things like that. But there's also a lot of like business integration, right? So maybe your company is using Slack and their company is using teams and it seems like a very small thing, but you know, when you're doing it at scale and having to do a lot of different employees, a lot of different applications, things like that also consumes a lot of your time. So I guess going back to like the, you know, cliches of an acquisition, like it's obviously a great moment, but the work doesn't stop there. And in some ways it changes and can be just as hard or harder. Or... As you shifted back to the corporate side, I think, you know, you hear people talk about it all the time that, you know, have been grinding away in terms of a startup. You know, sometimes on one hand, you hear people that are almost like relieved a little bit to have like a little bit more structure. Um, but other times people like really struggle with going back to a type of structure that they haven't, you know, worked under in a, in a really long time. Kind of where did you fall in that realm? I think the first thing was like, it, there is a, maybe a sense of comfort being in like a corporate environment. There was less doubt about like, you know, just like a, just like a solid steady paycheck, right? That's not always guaranteed in the startup world, right? Even when you're doing well, like things can quickly, can quickly change. So, I think that was one thing I was just like, okay, like it's, it's, you have at least a second to like take a breather here, but you know, big companies have their own challenges, problems, et cetera. And you know, the big one that people cite is just like bureaucracy, you know? So that was definitely a little difficult to adjust to. I think sometimes companies might be more willing to like, not, not willing to accommodate you. They just want you to like adopt their process without any consideration for like, why are your processes, how they are, how might that affect you? Things like that. Um, I think we were pretty fortunate in our situation that we were working with a good team and, you know, they gave us space. They, they helped us understand why we needed to do certain things. They were able to adjust on other things, but yeah, I mean, it was, it was a totally different experience. Still a lot of the same like product type work. I'd kind of moved to leading our product as like a product manager, product director by that point, but there's just a lot of, you know, different nuances in a corporate environment. And that was definitely challenging at times because you're used to moving really quickly. And it's not always possible. And a lot of times that's for good reason. But I think other times there's definitely room to adjust, right? It's, it's, it's kind of a spectrum. And so that, I'd say that was probably the most challenging part. But overall, it was a good experience. And, and I think I learned a lot from it. And 
I really wanted that too. Like, I think it's important if you're going to be leaving a company, you got to understand scale and understand what happens in those different phases. And so it's just good to start learning about how like a large company operates because it had been a while since I'd been in that kind of circumstance. As you are leading the product team going through there, was there a specific moment or point when you kind of got that entrepreneurial itch again of, you know, trying to figure out what's next? What did, what did that look like for you? I think for me, I mean, obviously the, the itch is always there. I think for me, part of it too was just like, it had been a long time, especially in like startup entrepreneurial years, right? Like going on, you know, when we got acquired, it had been over five years and, you know, as we're getting, you know, six months, 12 months kind of into that, you're coming up on six, seven years. And, you know, that's a lot these days. Most people don't, you know, at least our generation, right? They may not last the companies more than two years on average. You factor in the fact that it's a startup and it feels like, you know, every day is like seven days or, or more. It just felt like a long time. And so for me, it was my, I think my main motivation was, like starting to figure out what was next that would kind of like reignite some of my passions. Um, Cause I, I just think over time, right? Like you just, it's not, you know, we do like mobile device repair and like there was a cool field and there was a cool space, but like after a long time, like I, I wanted to be doing something else that was just like, it wasn't going to suit me forever. And just kind of started, I'd say more so than like getting the itch to like do stuff on my own necessarily. It was like, okay, want to find something that like I'm, passionate about because I've been there. Like I know what it feels like when you're really into something and it's a great feeling. And you know, the cliche, like it doesn't feel like work, et cetera. Like I think a lot of those things are true. Uh, and so I just kind of started getting the itch to, to find that and just started like making a plan about maybe like what that timeline might look like when I wanted to start thinking about, you know, exiting. And when you were thinking about making that plan, I know a lot of guests we've talked to in the past, they think about like a specific amount of money they want to have as a benchmark, or they want to give themselves like a specific date where, you know, they're like in three months, uh, I'm going to make this leap no matter what other people want to have another job or a specific like idea validated to go to like, you know, what did, what did your plan look like? And how did you prioritize thinking about leaving? Yeah. So obviously that's important. Uh, I purposely didn't know like, what I wanted to do next, whether that's starting my own company, consulting, joining another company that was like, it was kind of intentional that I wanted to have that dedicated time afterwards to figure that out. But obviously part of that is like money, right? You want to have savings and, and that kind of stuff. Kind of an interesting little side story here. And, you know, I know people have different opinions all about all this. And sometimes it's like funny to think about myself, but, you know, back in mid 2021, I kind of fell into trading NFTs, essentially. I had been involved with crypto for a while, like kind of investing and buying here and there. You know, I bought Bitcoin at like $200, but then sold it for a loss, like kind of obviously hitting myself for that now, but that's just the way these things work. You know, I, I started becoming more involved in this on the side. I got involved with this like community of people through some friends that were all into it. And also it was very successful. I mean, it was like beyond anything I would have imagined. And long story short, I was able to make money from that, that, that ended up supplementing and essentially making me more comfortable walking away from something. I knew that wasn't a full-time, uh, long-term gig just because it's such a new technology that was clearly a bubble. There was a lot of hype, but I was able to actually take profit and like realize gains that I could then say, okay, now I have money in my bank account you know, X amount compared to like, here's how long it can last. Like it, I don't, I don't want to go through it though. That's not my goal. Like I want to, you know, have that as like to save up and invest and things like that. But ultimately I would say my plan kind of got fast forwarded in that sense where I just kind of by September, by October, like I was in a spot where I just realized, okay, I'd be comfortable walking away. I can actually still continue to make money doing this on the side as I figure out uh, what to do next now the whole market in general kind of collapsed in like April and May, but you know, that meant I, it's that, that stuff's kind of on pause, but, but again, like it, it allowed me to feel comfortable to take an extended, you know, period if I wasn't going to be making money. From when you quit, what did it look like in terms of your first, you know, week, month, couple months off? Were you just looking to take the time and space to just relax and clear your mind? Were you trying different things or, you know, what did that initial like short-term time frame look like? It's been kind of a roller coaster. You know, first I, I would say, I didn't 
take a ton of time to just like relax right away. I think I had in my mind that, you know, once I had time off, I was going to just talk with a, a bunch of people. Right. And, and I, I put out a LinkedIn post kind of about leaving and what I was thinking about next and got some phone calls with some people like old friends or colleagues, et cetera. And I just started talking with a lot of people and just kind of learning about potential opportunities. And, you know, initially my goal was to kind of like dip my hand in a little of, of each of these things. Right. Like there was maybe some consulting, some was more just like advising and maybe just helping some people out. But I would say within like a couple of weeks of that, I, I quickly found that like all my time was suddenly locked up again. Like it was just like, I was doing enough here and there that I didn't have necessarily the free time or flexibility that I wanted. I'd kind of just like grab the things that had come. And then, you know, that was that. So I kind of realized that I, I felt like I was moving too quickly and, you know, also wanted a little more time to just step back and relax and, and also like be a little more uh, just like reflective about what I actually wanted to do. So from there, I actually kind of did the opposite. So I kind of like, none of these things were, you know, there was a couple of official consulting things, but it was mostly just like some advising where I was able to like slowly step back. And from there, I honestly just took some time to relax a little bit. My wife and I traveled a little bit. She's a teacher, so we didn't get to do a ton. You know, and, and the, the NFT stuff kept up, honestly. Like I was still finding time to be, uh, to do that. And it was still profitable and those kinds of things. So I would say that delayed me necessarily looking for the next thing, just because I was, you know, enjoying myself. I, I got going to the gym again. It had been like, I don't know, like pre COVID since I'd been in a good gym routine. So starting to devote your focus to things outside of the office and just kind of, you know, again, I think it's like a big de-stressing de-stressor, right? Like just getting back to those things and not just letting work dominate your life. No, that's such a good point. Cause I think we all have the tendency to, even if we start our own business to kind of like gravitate back towards that, like nine to five concept or like constantly being busy and filling up time. So I'd be curious, you know, when you actually went through and took like a step back and spent like less time and really started thinking about like bigger picture, did that change your priorities on how you looked at the type of work you wanted to do, how much, you know, work you were going to do? Like, did that change anything like that or, or did it just kind of give you the time and space to let you relax a little bit and then dive back in? I think part of it was, I just got to relax a bit. Um, you know, some things happened, like the, the whole market just kind of slowed down and crashed a lot in a lot of ways. So that meant that like less of my time was focused in those areas. And I think from then I kind of, I was like comfortable with how I was living for like those two months. But then I also just started noticing that like I was getting really bored. Right. And so like, it wasn't like, I didn't need to, you know, start going on for things or, you know, figure it out, but I was just getting bored. And I was like, okay, not that I was, I, I, I use the word retired, not that I was retired at all. Cause I'm definitely not, but it made me think like, now I understand why, like when my grandfather retired, he's so freaking bored. It's just like, you can find hobbies, but also there's like work does fill certain gaps in your life. I was like, okay, like I, I had this break, like now, now it's time to start figuring things out. I would say not complicated, but like an added wrinkle is that uh, my wife and I are expecting our first child in about a month. So that played a part in it as well, where I didn't want to necessarily jump full steam ahead into something, or I wanted to be able to like maintain that flexibility that I already desired, but it kind of became even more important. Just knowing that, okay, in like a few months, there's a newborn baby here and they're going to require time and, you know, my wife will be home and things like that. So but at the same time, recognizing like I am ready to get into something, right? I don't want to just be sitting around for another couple of months. And so that's kind of what started leading me to really start now embracing and deep diving into like what I want to do. What are you most excited about kind of diving into now that you're kind of ready to get back at it? Yeah, it's kind of funny. I would say the answer is that I, I still don't know. I think when I left my job, you know, I would, I expected just like to have all these opportunities just thrown my way. And that's not to say that I haven't had opportunities, but I think I'm, I'm being very intentional and picky about things. So like, I don't necessarily know what the perfect opportunity looks like, but when it's not the perfect opportunity, it's pretty apparent to me. And the other side of it is that like, it's kind of this idea of like decision fatigue where you have a ton of options, right? It's just like when you watch Netflix and you can't figure out what to watch. And so kind of 
having this freedom, which was intentional and also not needing, you know, being fortunate to not like need to go back to work, you know, and be able to take my time. It's definitely created some internal conflict. I, I, I think maybe I have some, somewhat of a clearer picture now, but honestly, I go back and forth sometimes week to week and it's evolving. And I'm, I'm, I think I'm learning more about like what I want to do, but it's honestly hard. And I think that's one of the biggest like learnings I've had or just like experiences is just like, it's, it's not always easy. Even if you feel like you have a lot of opportunities, just because like, I don't want to just jump into something. I want this next thing to be passion, right? Like that kind of thing that can really keep me going through these next, you know, whatever, three, five, 10 years. It's, you know, kind of interesting hearing you talk about all your different experiences. You know, you've gone full corporate, you've worked for a startup, you've taken a break, you've done part-time consulting, you've done all these things. You know, nowadays we're talking about like how the workplace is shifting a lot in terms of like hybrid workforce, fully remote, different hours of like not necessarily just being like nine to five, you know, with all your experiences and kind of thinking about what you want next, do you have a ideal kind of like work-life balance or kind of like work schedule that you strive for, or is it going to be kind of dependent on the type of role that you take? So definitely a little bit dependent on the role I take, you know, I'll, I'll be like transparent. I know maybe it goes a little bit against the, you know, the podcast, but like there is a scenario where I go back to a corporate world. Like that's, I'm purposely leaving that on the table right now, you know, having a family, things like that. If, if the right opportunity presents itself and, you know, to be transparent, they want to pay me a lot of money. Like I, that's something I would consider, right? If I'm passionate about the work and things like that, that's not the ultimate goal though. Even something like that would be kind of like a stopgap, right? So I think ultimately the right thing for me is something that allows me to be flexible. I think you need somewhat of a routine. That's another thing that I've kind of struggled with a bit during this time. It's just like, how do you develop that routine if there's nothing that's necessarily like pushing you or no one telling you you have to be doing certain things? So it's always going to be like time blocks and things like that, I think. But also need the ability to be flexible, to kind of control your schedule. And really, I think to be able to dip your hands in a couple of things at once. I think like, you know, not that I was an investor by any means, but getting more involved with like the crypto space and even like general investing and things like that. I think it just made me more aware. Like, you know, people always talk about diversification and there's like different thoughts on that. It's not always maybe the best thing, but I started like thinking about those models in my personal life. Right. And so like, how can you kind of strive for like the best chances of success? And that's to me, it's by like kind of having multiple options. Right. So you know, you always have your like investments, but then maybe your full-time job, but when you have a full-time job, it might be hard to have all these other opportunities. So, so yeah, I think the ideal next step for me is opportunities where I'm, I'm doing something I'm passionate about, which likely is like helping companies build products or consulting with them to kind of advise them and just what I've learned and helping them be more effective and building the right products. But again, it still comes down to like, I want to find areas I'm passionate about within that. So, you know, I don't want to be necessarily helping someone build a product that, you know, I don't know, monitors toilets, right? Like you still want to find that, uh, that space to, to do something that you're actually interested in. And that goes back to like, one of the things I've discovered is like, as I've been consulting in certain ways, I've realized that like, it's also harder to be engaged with certain things. If you immediately know you're not like as invested in it you might not be as tied to it. So that's also been another like mind shift with the consulting side is like figuring out like where your sweet spot is, how to still stay focused when maybe you're not, you don't love what the company's doing or whatever. Right. There's, I mean, I'm sure you go through that too. with like building apps, right? Like there's a lot of people out there who are either looking to quit their job or have like recently quit their jobs. You know, you've now gone through it a couple of times, have joined a startup as well as, kind of had your own side ventures as well. You know, what's kind of the best piece of advice you would give someone who's like looking to go down a similar path? Yeah, I think I would say if you can tolerate the risk that's involved with these things, and first off, like don't underestimate the risk, it's always going to be harder than you think. And it's always going to take longer than you think. Generally, if you can handle that risk, it's a great opportunity. And, and the main reason I think is just because of what you learn. You're basically forced to learn things, right? You might... As a, as a business owner, you might have to, you might be technical, but now you suddenly have to learn accounting and, and business and marketing and all this other stuff that there's, you have to learn it because there's no one else, right? Like if you want to survive, you, so you just acquire a lot of skills that ultimately I think whether or not the business succeeds or fails, 
as long as you're still in a comfortable or like safe position, those skills, I think will just pay off down the road. So like you could go back to your last job if you wanted to, and you know, you might be three, four levels ahead coming into my, let's say last job or some of the roles I had at the startup. Like, I don't know that I would have just walked in the door and just like got them just because some of these, you know, I'm walking into rooms with other companies that have like people that are like 30 years older than me. And that's not to say I'm that far ahead, but like, it just allow affords you opportunities that it's just not possible because of the structure of, uh, of a large company. But then you can kind of get into, you know, you have that experience now and suddenly you are a candidate maybe at some of those other roles and things like that. So, you know, really it's like risk and experience. Like if you can handle the risk, I say like go for it. But again, it's always harder than it seems. So you can definitely fail with it. But I mean, I think my mindset with, you know, the first two jobs I took where, you know, I had to give up a lot to do them was that like, no matter what, I think I'll get more enough out of this that I'll be better off than I would have been otherwise. I know we touched on this like a little bit before in terms of like, you know, the types of projects and things that you're interested in. But, you know, for every guest, we we ask kind of the same question for everyone leaving, which is, you know, what are you most excited about over the next three to five years? Yeah, I mean, I think I think number one, you know, being a dad, I think it's that's obviously like suddenly a big focus. And so that is going to play into whatever I do next, right? Like whether that's taking a full-time job because it's a little more comfortable or whatever. You know, I think three to five years, ultimately, that's probably me. I, my ideal vision is like, I'm running my own company. It's successful. It's something that I like genuinely enjoy doing. Now, what that is, is still kind of up for grabs. I think there's obviously, you know, knowing my background in product and technology is probably related to that. Ultimately, this next thing might be like a stepping stone to that potentially, whether that's like starting some consulting and things like that. You know, again, I'll be honest, like it's, it's, it, it would took a lot out of me building for a while. And so I don't know if I'm in, it, right ready to go back to that, but I know eventually uh, I'll be ready for that. So that's kind of what's going through my head now. And uh, yeah, we'll see. I'm excited to see how it develops. I'm really excited to see where you take it next. Uh, I definitely appreciate your time and uh, thank you. Thank you so much for uh, joining yeah, us awesome. today. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Dave. It was great talking to you. Thank you for listening. It really means a lot to us. We want to hear from you as we keep growing. Please reach out on whyquit.co if you have any feedback or potential guests. A special thanks to Chris Dole for the music. Please check out his newest album, Here's to You, on Spotify. Thank you, and we will be back next week with another episode.